Kichabis. And uh, we can now say the blessing for the uh, first workers' holiday in history, basically. Judaism is a workers' you know, cultural religion. And you can easily see that if you actually translate the Hebrew in the daily prayers in particular. Okay, here we go. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'alom, sheher kitshanu, v'metzotav b'tzivanu, l'hadnik ne'a Shabbos. Okay. Okay, now we're going to continue with the reading of the very important work and study by Lars Fischer on the uh, Second International Marxists and their debates and problems with anti Semitism on what was called the Jewish question. Unfortunately, you know, many Marxists still refer to the Jewish question, as if there were a question. There is no question as to the existence of the Jewish people. To phrase it as such is a precondition for the Nazi Holocaust. Don't use it. Okay, let's continue with Lars Fischer. The socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state during the time of the Second International in the 19th century. Okay, here we go. And this is a reading on behalf of the Jewish Socialist Bund. And it should be mentioned, we exist, and we continue to exist amongst the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto and Poland and Hungary and all of Eastern Europe and Russia, we survived. Don't tell us that the Bund, you know, is non-existent. <laughs> we are here. I am here. In Senedu, in Senedu, the Yiddish Bund, and that's in Yiddish. So for those who have difficulty understanding the English, and that should settle the matter. Okay. Let us continue. Now we get to chapter five, page 136, I believe. The former anti-Semite Luce on anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. There it is again. Luce certainly made Okay, here we go. No, we have to go back to... I've lost the share. Okay, we'll stop sharing, we'll start it again. Okay, no problem. Here we go. Finally found the page. Okay, we're up to page 135 of Lars Fischer's study book on the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state of the Second International. The former anti-Semite loose that we've talked about so much and how the Social Democrats, you know, couldn't get it together to figure out what it was all about. On anti-Semitism and the Jewish question, there it is again, yeah. Luce certainly made a concerted effort to present himself as a reformed character. Yet, in this quest to reinvent himself, attempts to demonstrate an actual change in his notions regarding the Jews, 
did not feature prominently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In this respect, Luce's approach differed markedly from that of his friend, Helmut von Gerlach, who repeatedly discussed his affection from organized political anti-Semitism. For Gerlach, the reasons leading to his change in attitude, not just in party political affiliation, were part and parcel of that discussion. That said, Gerlach's conversion narratives all date from the 1920s and 1930s, and it is fairly obvious that they were meant as a commentary on the renewed rise of political anti-Semitism in the Weimar period and the emergence of National Socialism. <clears throat> the escalation of the Weimar years brought with it the beginning of a fundamental sea change in perceptions of anti-Semitism, the prevalent emphasis on its futility, disingenuousness, disingenuousness, and ludicrousness gradually began to give way to an increasing recognition of the serious threat it might pose. To be sure, all too many still did not get it, but some did begin to develop an inkling of what was at stake. One of them, as we shall see in chapter seven, was Edward Bernstein. Gerlach too was among them. In this light, his ability to change his orientation took on an entirely different significance. Surely his own anti-Semitic past qualified him exceptionally well, and thus made it his particular duty to vouch for the erroneous and futile nature of political anti-Semitism. <clears throat> Luce, by contrast, did not live to see this development. He died in the summer of 1920, and his attitude towards his own anti-Semitic past remained defiant until the end. As we saw before, Luce maintained that he had already begun to distance himself from organized political anti-Semitism at the time of his conviction. This version of events he upheld not only to his subsequent publications, but also in private communications. Following the first decision of the Fraktion, for instance, Luce wrote to Kautsky on 9th of December, 1899. Mehring had already informed him of the misgivings I still arouse among former opponents, Luce explained. Quote, five years lie between my former political activity and my current orientation, among them three and a half years, i.e. the dur duration of his imprisonment, of a self-observation and self-criticism so through, thorough, that they were more amply explain the drastic change of my opinions. He, is, he then summed up this drastic change as follows. I have been cured of my ambition to have a political career. Oh, in fact, Quote, he had already informed my then friends of my decision to resign from parliamentary life before my conviction. Oh, yeah. Although Luce initially spoke of drastic change in his opinions then, his subsequent emphasis lay elsewhere altogether. All Luce was really saying was that he intended for some time before his imprisonment to give up active politics. How he now felt about Jews and what he thought should be done about them was again an issue that was not even on the horizon. He obviously felt no desire to address it of his own accord, nor does he seem to have assumed that anybody else might be interested in it. Yes. Luce does not tell us a little more about his radical change in Astem Zachtrus, Zachtrus, though, quote, my opinions and notions have reached a dead end <laughs> by the time of his conviction. Yeah, dead end mind. In the course of 15 years, quotes, I had moved from the extreme right further and further to the left. Oh, yeah? He explained. He quote, as an anti as an anti-Semite, he went on, quote, I had become one of those national anti-Semites who sympathize with the Zionists and think highly of the Jews and hate them not as individuals, but only as a community, precisely because of their merits. Oh, yeah. On his own account, then, it was as an anti-Semite that he had moved from the extreme right further and further to the left. This move to the left had not led him to question his anti-Semitism. It had only changed the character of his self-professed anti-Semitism. Nor did he claim that its vehemence decreased as a result of, his, of this change. He had become a sort of anti-Semite, Luce tells us, who hates, quote, hates them, the Jews, not as individuals, but only, only as a community, unquote. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
he had not stopped hating the Jews, but merely hated them in a different way and for different reasons. Uh -huh. Surely we would have been more inclined to expect a retreat roughly along the following lines. While I remain critical of the Jews, I realize that hate was not appropriate response to their critique worthy qualities. <laughs> Luz, however, continued to hate the Jews. But it was not only hate that he felt for the Jews, he also thought highly of them and now hated them precisely because of their merits. This is philo Semitism. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Needless to say, the solution to this apparent paradox lies in his sympathy for the Zionists. Ah, did Zionists not imply that the Jews would remove themselves from their current countries of residence? To many anti-Semites, this might have seemed like a dream come true. Clearly, the radical separation of Jews and non-Jews was still his goal at the end of these 15 years in which he had moved persistently, quote, from the extreme right further and further to the left, unquote. It was still his goal when he was supposedly already a former anti-Semite. What emerges as a genuine change again in his account is in Ostem Zachtrus, Trus, is his wish to leave active politics. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we find similar instructive snippets throughout his subsequent publications. In one instance, he praised the wisdom of one of the character witnesses he called upon when he was tried for perjury. This witness was a man quote, of the most incisive judgment, unquote. Luce wrote in 1906, more than a decade after he had supposedly ceased to be an anti-Semite. Who was this man? Of the most incisive judgment, it was Dr. Koenig Witten, then a member of the Reichstag. This is not the first time we come across this figure in Lucius's writings. A year later, Luz had published a book on Wilhelm von Hammerstein, 1838-1904, a former member of the Reichstag, and a stalwart of the conservatives' extreme right wing, who had stood at the helm of the staunchly anti-Semitic Kreuzer Zeitung, Naya Prussische Zeitung, from 1881 to 1895. In this book, Dr. Koenig was introduced as the most capable political leader of the anti Semites. Aha! This man not only struck Luce as a, as a suitable character witness at the time of his trial when he supposedly already radically questioned his previous orientation, but even a decade and more later, he still held the man in high esteem and thought nothing of it. Nor did Lucius's radical change prevent him from treating Hammerstein in an uncritical manner. In his book on Hammerstein, he in fact made a rather interesting remark on Hammerstein's anti-Semitism. In connection with the dealings of his estate in Sch Schwarztow, Hammerstein had been commercially involved with a Jewish entrepreneur who was, rather deliciously, we might add, called Priester. Priester had, quote, established a matchstick factory and wrote to Hammerstein years ago asking for help. He was on the verge of bankruptcy. Hammerstein and his wife agreed to lend Herr Priester a large sum, 20 or 30,000 mark, and Frau von Hammerstein personally brought him the money. Herr Priester was sick and soon died. Hammerstein's assistance notwithstanding, the estate was declared bankrupt soon after the capital was lost. Okay. But then the constellation radically changed. On the one hand, Priester's sons managed to get the factory up and running again. On the other hand, Hammerstein was convicted in 1896 for fraudulently using his position with the Kutzer Zeitung for the generation of personal income. At this juncture, the Priester family had started to pay regular monthly installments to begin settling their late father's debt to Hammerstein. It would seem then, quote unquote, Luz concluded, quote, that Hammerstein's anti Semitism was of a purely political nature and only influenced his personal attitude towards Jews when political considerations were at stake, unquote. This antidote is remarkable in two respects. The first remarkable fact, and presumably the one Luz wanted to draw our attention to, is this. A local Jewish entrepreneur not only thought it worth asking Hammerstein for support in the first place, but actually received it. Yet it is surely equally remarkable to say at least, to say the least, that the Priester family decided to pay back their deceased father's debts 
even though they were legally in no way compelled to do so. That they did so precisely when Hammerstein had fallen from grace suggests that they acted primarily out of humanitarian concern. Indeed, who would begrudge them this smugness they may well have felt when this high-ranking anti-Semitic aristocrat was transformed into a beneficiary of private Jewish philanthropy? Yet this side of the story seems to have entirely passed loose by. For Luce, Hammerstein's, quote-unquote, purely political antisemitism was clearly a redeeming feature. It set Hammerstein apart from those who were driven by mere mindless resentment or inclined to be petty in their dealings with individual Jews. Hammerstein, by contrast, had belonged to those who saw the bigger picture and aspired to co comprehensive solutions without arbitrarily harassing random individuals. It is obvious enough why this differentiation should have been important to Luce. His emphasis on the ostensible superiority of Hammerstein's purely political antisemitism pointed to the sophistication of his own approach and has helped underscore his own post-antisemitic credentials. At the same time, it allowed him to insist upon those credentials without falling into the philo-Semitic trap. After all, there would have been a far more effective and, by standards, a little less warped than those that struck the likes of Luce as self-evident. Far more obvious way to demonstrate his anti uh, anti judeophobic credentials. He could simply have placed his emphasis on the noble attitude of the Priester family rather than the merits of Hammerstein's particular brand of anti Semitism. Aha. Mm -hmm. The contrast loose drew between Hammerstein's superior brand of anti Semitism and other lesser ones was pretty common fare in Imperial German discourse. Trichter, for instance ostensibly, ostens ostentatiously distance himself from the rado antisemitismus, the loutish antisemitism that was unleashed by Stoker's propaganda activities, yet that by no means precluded his maintaining that the uh, rado semitismus was a legitimate response to actual Jewish abuse nor did it prevent his ostensibly more respectable line of argument from hinging on the same logical structure, substance, and implications as Stroker's propaganda. The alleged superiority of political over merely emotive anti-Semitism that Luce saw as one of Hammerstein's redeeming features was also a well-rehearsed trope. Eventually, this very superiority would be Hitler's point of departure for the development of his specific anti-Semitic ideology. These differentiations by no means question the plausibility and viability of anti-Semitism as such. They are no more than discursive devices that allow a flexible adaptation and reproduction of anti-Semitic ideology under varying circumstances. It is therefore rather striking that they should still seem so self-evident to loose a decade after he had supposedly left his anti-Semitism behind him. All this indicates that a fair share of the tenets that had comprised his worldview as an anti-Semitic activist had survived his defection from organized party political anti-Semitism quite unscathed. Based merely on the few snippets presented so far, this may seem a rather strong claim. There is additional, rather more substantive, Evidence, though, albeit from a slightly later date. In January 1919, Luce published a long editorial on war anti-Semitism in the Welt am Montag. There is, of course, an obvious problem here. Can we simply assume that the opinions expressed in this editorial still reflect, more or less accurately, what Luce thought at the turn of the century? i.e. during the dispute that concerns us here. We can best address this issue by examining the juncture at which Luce wrote in this editorial on war anti-Semitism. Following the publication of Us Zem Zachtros back in 1903, Luce left Berlin. He took on the management of an estate, but also continued to write. He returned to full-time journalism in 1909 when he joined Gerlach, at the helm of the Welt am Montag, Gerlach increasingly in inclined towards a pacifist position and in 1914 opposed the war from the outset. Hmm. 
Luce, by contrast, was totally carried away by patriotic, patriotic fervor. Mm -hmm. In his eulogy for Luce, Gerlach later recalled how Luce had still welcomed the initial success of the final German offensive on the Western Front in the spring of 1918 as a major turning point. Quote, smiling, I said to him, quote, Dear Luce, you will regret this article. Gerlach was right not only in the sense that Germany longer, no longer stood a chance of winning the war, Luce was not merely proven wrong, he really did come to regret the position he had taken. Gerlach emphasized this in his eulogy. As opposed to many others, Luce also had the stature subsequently to admit squarely that his support of the German war effort had been misguided. That's all, just misguided. Uh -huh. as, long, quote, as long as I, like many others, judged the issue of Germany's war guilt, and the peaceful aspirations of German statesmen differently than V. Gerlach, I also propounded a different political approach to the war, unquote. Luce wrote in the Weltan Montag of the 31st of March, 1919. I was wrong. Yes, well, yet Luce did not want to stop at an admission of bygone mistakes. Given that I got it wrong at the beginning of the war, he concluded, I do not now want to get it wrong again with the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he wants a, a suitable position in the administration thereafter, no doubt. Okay. Luce was deeply disturbed by the increasingly violent conflict within the socialist camp. He denounced the communists in no uncertain terms. Their actions only provoked and legitimatized counter-revolutionary violence. Yet the communists were not, in the end, the biggest problem. Quote, what is the worst aspect of the Spartacus weeks, he wrote in the immediate aftermath, of the January insurrection and its suppression in Berlin. What was, quote, most terrible about this development was, quote, the dreadful fact, which is destined to beget further harm, that the Spartacus attempt to establish a tyranny against the will of the people has driven the revolutionary government to resort to violence. Not that the government had really had much choice in the matter, but that made the facts no less awful and portentous. Oh. So the government's resort to violence was not their fault. Oh. Fascist repression is not the fault of the government. Uh -huh. Okay. In a pamphlet on Schneidemann, he later reiterated this, again emphasizing his concern that the government's use of military force had severely shaken many worthy workers' trust in the revolution. What is he talking about? This trust needed to be restored and this task now emerged clearly as Lucas's main goal. He was indeed interpreted, determined not to get it wrong again. All this strongly suggests that the Luce we met again in early 1919 is Luce at his most radical and critical. As we saw, Luce developed and first articulated this orientation in the immediate aftermath of, of the January insurrection. Yet this is also the various juncture at which he published his long editorial on war anti-Semitism. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Now I know what he's referring to. Uh, during the uh, insurrection, uh, um, Liebnik and uh, Luxembourg, who were the leaders, were accused of uh, taking an uh, ultra-left uh, position, but uh, they really didn't have any choice. You know, Otherwise, it would have been uh, a bigger disaster. Okay, in any case, they were repressed and Rosa Luxemburg was assassinated. And uh, Lipnik was uh, also killed by the so-called revolutionary government. In any case, <clears throat> it appeared exactly a week after the editorial just cited in which he first described as the worst aspect of the January events, the fact that the government had let itself be provoked into resorting to violence. Oh! Oh, yeah, it's not really the fault of the government, you know, it's just that, oh, yeah, I mean, it's something or other, they were provoked, you know, like, provoked. <laughs> provoked by what? <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Lipnick? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so how many tanks did they have? <laughs> okay. It seems highly likely that at this juncture, we not only meet Luce at his most radical, but also at his most anti judaphobic in our sense of the word. We may, we may not be able to say for sure whether Luce thought about anti-Semitism and 
the Jewish question in exactly the same way in 1899 or 1903 as he did in 1919. But whatever he did think back then must surely have been lain somewhere between what was what we already know about his earlier approach on the one hand and the position presented in this editorial on the other. As we will see, that hardly leaves much room for variation anyway. Ha! Ah. Lucis's editorial on war anti-Semitism was a response to the elections for the Nationale Versammlung. Wow. Constituent Assembly. Oh, yeah. That's nice. And it's called in German Nationale Versammlung. Yes, I understand that now. It's a, a national uh, convergence, in effect. The conservatives had given their campaigning for these elections distinctly anti-Semitic flavor, and Lucas's editorial sought to offer an explanation for the relative success of this strategy. Once again, Lucas explained, anti-Semitism had reared his head as, quote, the last anchor of the hopeless and the toppled. This is the third anti-Semitic wave to stir the people since the beginning of the last century. Only a wave, not a surge. Greater issues, more critical questions, more powerful impulses determine the pulse of current affairs and the political will of the people. Unquote. Nevertheless, quote, a new anti-Semitic wave there is, unquote. It was, quote, no more than a, ep an episode and a subordinate phenomenon, just as it was in the past. Oh, really? Unquote. But it was, quote, not restricted to those who voted for the 40 conservative members of the Constituent Assembly. Democrats, too, even voters for the German Democratic Party, pronounced harsh judgments on the behavior of Jews during the war. But, Lewis contended, unfolding a classic set piece of anti-Semitism in its crude skies, quote, they are not so stupid immediately to make the Jewish question a pivot of world history, as the anti-Semitic mystics do. They are too intelligent to believe the fools who would turn the Jewish question into a political procrustean bed and try to force the whole universe into it. The sensible ones, he summed up this point, oppose such an overestimation of Jewry. Hmm. Where, then, had this new anti-Semitism come from? It had, quote, begun when the war began. Oh, really? Not before? Initially, it was mere mindless hatred, not even curtailed by the obvious, purely national interest. There's a national interest in anti-Semitism? Really? Oh. Even while the papers were full of Jewish obituaries and with a war cross, a cross, <laughs> anti-Semitic papers published rabble-rousing articles and denunciatory stories of the worst sort. Even when Ludwig Frank, one of the first victims of the fighting in France, had fallen, and while many, indeed very many Jews, went to the front voluntarily, the hatred of the fanatics nevertheless failed to fall silent. But this hatred would have remained a miserable plant in the corner. Unquote. Lewis continued, quote, had not a good many things transpired and developed in the course of the four years that prompted the critique of serious people. Unquote. The subsequent accounts displayed all the enduring and necessarily insurmountable problems inherent in the kernel of truth approach to antisemitism. Lewis outlined a catalog of indiscretions of which the Jews had been accused. It was these perceived indiscretions that had generated the new anti-Semitism. Yet, as Luce was, for the most part, happy to concede these accusations were unfounded, how then was it that he, they could nonetheless, nevertheless arouse the critique of serious people as well? Surely the accusations leveled at the Jews could only be either true or untrue. They could only either justify the critique of serious people or demonstrate the fallacy of the anti-Semitic line of argument, but not do both. Luce's motivation at this point is rather obvious. As a former anti-Semitic activist, Luce himself had once subscribed to the anti-Semites' erroneous perceptions and generalizations. Had he done so out of mindless hatred, quote unquote? Surely not. He, of course, belonged to the serious people, but had nonetheless gone beyond their justified critique of Jewish indiscretions. 
what in fact lies between a possible justified critique of individual, individual Jews or groups of Jews and the anti-Semitic generalization is this. Instead of a grasp of reality based on the use of one's critical facilities, the anti-Semite relies on the process of stereotyping that renders negative perceptions of the Jews and a self-fulfilling prophecy. The difference between the justified critique and the erroneous generalizations is by no means one's of degree. In other words, it is one of principle. An, insurmount an insurmountable chasm gaps between the two. Since Luce was clearly neither willing nor able to face up to this fact, he could only bridge this gap by fudging the entire issue. He could only invent a palatable version of his own past if there was a direct link between the justified critique and the projection of stereotypes. There had to be a bridge between the two that one could simply cross in either direction without seriously having to question one's previous assumptions and overall worldview. Since this bridge does not and cannot exist, he could only posit its existence without further explanation. But if he had been able to cross it first in one direction and then in the other, he could obviously hardly deny others, including the new anti-Semites he set out to criticize with his editorial on war anti-Semitism, the right and ability to cross it in either direction as ever they saw fit. Mm -hmm. um, let's take pause. Okay, let's get back into it. Here, I'll, let me show you the uh, Shabbos candles again. But no, here they are. Appropriately red candles. Of course. Okay, here we go again. The war economy, Lewis explained, was dependent on the participation of businessmen of the grain trade, the stock exchanges and banks, and many other branches in which the Jews are very numerous or even in the majority. Naturally, the Jews come to the fore, unquote. As a result, quote, the animosity towards state control naturally turned against a large number of Jews among its directors and agents, unquote. <laughs> this is like, you know, the overestimation of the Zionist lobby in the United States. I mean, like, first of all, the Zionist lobby is not Jewish. You know, it includes some Jewish people, but includes many more Christian Zionists. And, you know, like, it does not control you as foreign policy. You know, nothing controls you as foreign policy. You know, the U.S. is the um, imperial power of the world, you know, the most, you know, powerful, the most important imperial power of all human history. And... Marsheimer thinks the Zionist lobby is controlling U.S. foreign policy, really. And even the money that they have allocated, you know, for uh, war expenditures for the Zionist state pales in comparison to what they have fed into the Ukraine. And yet the Ukraine has no Ukraine law. So the Zionist lobby is not determinant. You know, the reasons why the Zionist state is being supported, the same reasons why the Ukrainian state is being supported because it serves the interests of the United States offensive to push back any other power that exists in the world so that they would have world hegemony. Okay, so that's what's happening here during the First World War, the overestimation of a Jewish control in the state and so blaming the Jewish people for why the state was a warmonger, really, and also lost the war. Why? You know, and if Germany had won the war, would the so called Jewish influence, you know, would have been extolled and put into a place of glory? No, no, the anti Semitism would have continued nonetheless. Why? What should be natural about the projection of dissatisfaction with the state onto the Jews? All the usual questions arise. How did people know whether Jews held the majority of the responsible positions in certain sectors? because they made it up. Why did it matter to them? Because they're trying to build a case against Jewish people that doesn't exist. 
What was the point of turning on the Jews if one held grievances against the state? Because they're part of the state. As always with the kernel of truth approach, Lucius's line of argument, in fact, presupposes what it claims to explain. The anti-Jewish animosity and stereotypes have to be there in the first place. Otherwise, nobody would know how and why to hold the Jews accountable for things for which they were quite obviously not responsible. Quote, Jews were among the beneficiaries of the war, unquote, he continued. Oh, really? Huh. Hence, they, quote, became welcome and easily identifiable targets for the general aversion to war profits. Oh, so there weren't any German Christian war profiteers? It was all the Jewish so-called who? Bankers? Bankers who lent money for war production? And did they get it back? Probably not, because they lost the war. And the war was lost because of the anti-war sentiment of the German proletariat, which was brought to bear by Liebnick and uh, Rosa Luxemburg. And in the um, two, or is it three, um, insurrections that took place in Berlin, in um, Munich, and one other place. And um, in the second uh, insurrection, it was the left Social Democrats and the anarchists uh, with Adler who were uh, instrumental in that case. And uh, and so they were, uh, you know, like because there were some Jewish revolutionaries leading an anti-war movement, uh, the failure of Germany to win the war was uh, easily sort of, you know, transposed onto the, the Jewish revolutionaries, you know, who were against the war in the first place. Not that they were able to stop it. And so uh, the uh, the failure of uh, the Germany in the war was obviously due to the spontaneous refusal of the Germans to fight any further and die. Okay, this truly paradigmatic formulation surely needs to be turned from its head onto its feet. The Jews did not become an easily identifiable target because of the things some Jews did. It was because, quote, the Jews, unquote, already were firmly established in the popular imagination as an easily identifiable target that the activities of some Jews seemingly justified the continued projection of well-established stereotypes onto all Jews. That Luce should get this so wrong is all the more remarkable given that he himself readily conceded the fallacy of the argument. The Jews were held responsible, quote, quite without justification for the war profits accrued on a very equal and interdenominational basis, and the Aryans accepted them just as the Jews did, supposedly. Everyone knows that all races are equally guilty of participation in that scandalous profiteering frenzy. In fact, were the history and shady deals, bribes, and mean profiteering to be determined with exactitude, one would ultimately ascertain a predominance of, quote, and now followed a most remarkable switch of perspective, Quote, those classes that exploit the anti-Jewish hatred now that they face their political demise. Hmm. How did we get from races to classes? We might have expected Lucis's line of argument to continue as follows. On exact examination, one would not only find that non-Jews had also been among the profiteers, one would in fact find more non-Jews than Jews among them. Of course, this goes without saying by the sheer force of their numbers, non-Jews had, of course, been the predominant beneficiaries of the profiteering during the war. To suggest anything else would be nonsensical. Luce could have scored an easy, though perhaps somewhat banal, point against the anti-Semites had this been his concern. But then this would in turn have raised the question of how and why serious people, too, were susceptible to so nonsensical a suggestion and that this was a line of inquiry that would have brought Lucius's entire edifice crashing down. But none of this was Lucius's concern anyway. As we saw, the focus of his editorial was on the anti-Semitic dimension of the Conservatives' election campaign, i.e. on the organized utilization of anti-Semitism for party political ends. For him, the crucial point was this. The Conservatives' single most important clientele were the elites of the old regime, 
Now that, they, now that they were on their last leg and frantically struggling to keep their heads above water, they enlisted anti-Jewish sentiments to back up their cause. Yet they themselves had profited, profited far more from the war than the Jews. Once again, the critique did not hinge on the fact that the Jews were being targeted, but on the fact that these, those targeting them were hypocrites. To make this point, Luce obviously had to move away from the straightforward juxtaposition of Jews and non-Jews. He needed to find a way of denouncing the conservatives for the hypocritical exploitation of the anti-Jewish sentiments without at the same time denouncing the susceptibility of serious people to those some same sentiments. Mm -hmm. Susceptibility of the serious people to those same sentiments. To achieve this, Luce shifted the focus from race to class. Ah. What held true of the profiteering also held true of the scheming to evade military service at the front, Luce went on. Admittedly, quote, one also saw many Jews in safe locations, unquote. He conceded another of them in, the, in another of those classic formulations that bigger the more general question. How exactly does one supposedly see, quote unquote, Jews functioning in ways that could possibly generate terrible anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish generalizations that even serious people might fall for? Quote, but if the statistics for a requisitioned personnel should one day be differentiated by denomination, social status, and profession, then one will receive proof, unquote, that the picture the anti-Semites drew was incorrect. Again, the same issue arises. Yes, because he mentions that uh, Frank, the first, you know, uh, German uh, soldier to fall was Jewish. Frank, as in Anne Frank, hmm, of the same family, probably, because the Frank family went to uh, Amsterdam to escape uh, the Nazis in Germany and survived until one week before the end of the war, and Frank died of typhus. So we continue. Again, the same issue arises. We obviously need to differentiate by denomination to ascertain whether Jews and non-Jews behave differently. But now, can a differentiation by social status and profession help us in this respect? Again, Luce was preparing to switch from race to class. Such an analysis would show, quote, the members of the nobility and anti-Semitic, indeed even pan-German warmongers, were just as eager shirkers as the Jews. This was exactly the same argument as before. The conservatives' political clientele behaved at least as badly as the Jews. Therefore, it is hypocritical of them to enlist anti-Jewish sentiments for their own party political ends. In short, quote, if all these things are honestly examined and made public, the new anti-Semitism stands to gain little gratification and will certainly be in no position to pay the way for the conservative propaganda anymore, the nobility and its supporters. Unquote. Again, the focus was not on the non-Jews, more generally, but on the particular political opponent at hand. Quote, would then be exactly in the position of the German Jews who are forced to point to their dead, their selfless patriotism, the enormous achievements of the many, to offset, offset their share of responsibility for the war wrought. Their nobility would have to do exactly the same. Unquote. Luce then turned to another, slightly different form of anti-Semitism that inclines towards more idealistic motives. Uh -huh. So anti-Semitism is idealistic. Uh -huh. It took the, quote, form of anti-Semitism that takes issue with the paramount influence of Jews in public life and the revolutionary governments and institutions. Quote, this share is very large, unquote. He conceded. And then had a stab at irony. Quote, since ruling is today a very dubious, stressful, and even dangerous pleasure, quote, unquote, he went on, the considerable, quote, the considerable share of Jews involved in it cannot quite count as a sufficient reason for envy, but it can nevertheless be exploited as a material for anti-Semitic propaganda. Okay, let's, uh, sin let's uh, continue with this interesting sort of evaluation after a break. Okay, getting back to this mess. Let's uh, conclude uh, with another reading. And uh, then we will continue next week for Shabbos. Okay.
So, now, this brought back to his main, this brought him back to his main line of argument. Well, in fact, all sorts of things can be exploited against the Jews. The recollections of the war offer much material that can be adapted for anti-Semitic purposes. Indeed, one really needed to ask why the conservatives had ultimately got so little out of exploiting anti-Jewish sentiments. There are 40 seats in the Nationalische Versammlung could hardly mount an overwhelming harvest, given the ample and forcefully scattered anti-Semitic seed." Unquote. What then follows is truly remarkable and eerie, reminiscent of the stance Luce had formulated as an anti-Semitic deputy in his Zukunft in 1894. All this was obviously regrettable, regrettable he went on, but, quote, he says, worse than all this is another effect of the anti-Semitic agitation. The German Jews had learned a lot from the last anti-Semitic movement. They had become more level-headed and gradually came to take it for granted that just like other estates, classes, groups, associations, and denominations, Jews too are subject to critique. Hmm, I haven't heard of any such other critiques mm -hmm. from Luce. Some had even progressed far enough to acknowledge legitimate criticism of individual persons or occurrences of, as a form of hostile attention that deserves gratitude. Gratitude. Jewry in its entirely, entirety certainly grew morally, gained strength, and improved itself through its confrontation with anti-Semitism. The nervous touchiness receded while self-criticism increased. Just as the Catholic Church and social democracy owe a great deal to their opponent, Bismarck, really, the Jews owe a great deal to anti-Semitism. Oh, one must urgently advise the German Jews to stay on this path. And all the more so since many indicators prove that the acute anti-Semitic electoral agitation is making some Jews nervous again. There is no reason, no need for that. Oh, thank you for your advice. We should have followed your advice. Oh, yes. Okay. How could Jews best counter the anti-Semitic propaganda? By, quote, maintaining the most complete calm. What most definitely be avoided is the sort of moralizing Oh, and defamatory, Abwehr, so popular 40 years ago. Back then, it served the anti-Semites enormously. Morally, anti-Semitism in and of itself should be judged no differently from other political principles. It's a principle, he continued. This suggestion jarred, jars radically with our sensitivities. Yet how could Luce see it in any other way? One really could move freely between legitimate critique and the projection of stereotypes if anti-Semitism was ultimately no more than legitimate critique of serious people taken too far, then why, indeed, should it be judged indifferently from other political ideologies? And why, we might add, should anyone leaving the anti-Semitic exaggeration behind and returning to legitimate anti-Jewish critique of serious people be compelled to justify itself or herself? Why should his or her credibility be any more tarnished than that of anyone else who chooses to modify his or her political orientation and change his or her party political affiliation. Quote, class hatred, the struggle against, the younger and other issues are morally no different from anti-Semitism. He went on to elaborate. Oh yeah, so anti-Semitism is a form of opposition struggle against the Junker, Junkers. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yes, it was the Communist Party who said, after Hitler, us, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was, yeah. Okay, quote, they are merely felt to be morally different, depending on the point of view of the observer. My colleague, verse V. Gerlach, he then added, quote, coined the phrase, quote, of Gerlach, only he who has had this, the disease is immune to anti-Semitism. <laughs> okay. Unquote. I certainly am, then. I also know about the expedient and inexpedient in means of abwehr. And I declare again that I have said a number of times before, if Jewish authors cannot read anti-Semitic pamphlets without becoming emotionally anguished, they must keep this weakness to themselves. Oh, 
Most of all, they must not think that one could harm antisemitism with a load of moral outrage. On the contrary, he unquote, he concluded, moral outrage, you know, moral outrage is not called for. No, no, no. This then is, to the best of our knowledge, is loose and is most anti-Semitic, anti judeophobic and this is a stand at the turn of the century will most likely have been, if anything, even more problematic. Okay, let's see what's coming here. Uh, 146. Uh, oh, there's more, more, more trash. Okay, well, let's leave it at that. Okay, so it's 145. <sighs> Okay, that's enough for now. Oh boy, it is certainly sort of exhausting to go through the history of anti-Semitism and anguishing. There's a certain sort of, you know, like feeling, you know, like some sort of, you know, like gut feeling, you know, that there's no word for that I have to invent and I will. Okay, so that's it for this Shabbos. Here we go. Yeah, man. Okay, bye for now. On behalf of the Jewish Socialist Bund, the continuing Jewish Bund from the Warsaw Ghetto, we declare that we exist. And if you respect the Jewish Bund, then listen to what we have to say here and now. Tomorrow's Convergence Forum and on Sunday, we will have the here and now with Steve and Ahmed of Palestine. We continue as the Jewish Bund, the real Jewish Bund, the Emissary Yiddish Bund in Yiddish. In Zenin, Yiddish Bundist, Versuchen Zionism is nicht der Weg zu gehen. Zionism is not the way to, to go. It certainly does not defeat anti Semitism, merely nourishes it with another stereotype. Thank you for paying attention and we continue with the struggle.